Hello, everybody. Can I get your attention, please? Great. Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Brittany Miner. I'm the Vice President of External Community Relations at MBW. Um, and I think I can say that this is probably one of our uh, most well-attended kickoff events. So thank you all for being here. This is great. Great. So I think that's a testament to this amazing venue that we're in and this wonderful event that uh, we could put on with thanks to our sponsor, O'Brien Staley Partners. So let's give it up for OSP. Great. So I'm here today to introduce our speaker, uh, Jerry O'Brien. He's the CEO and CIO of O'Brien Staley Partners. Jerry is responsible for portfolio management at O'Brien Staley Partners and has over 25 years of experience. Prior to founding OSP in 2010, Jerry was a founding partner at Carvel Investors, where he managed the global loan portfolios. He has 17 years of experience across all aspects of the financial business for Cargill and Carvel, and 14 years of specialized experience in U.S. small balance C&I and CRE loan portfolios. So he served as a chairman of Cargill PAC from 2008 to 2010. And prior to joining Cargill in 1994, Jerry was a credit analyst at Chemical Bank and for subsidiaries of DG Bank in New York and Comerica Bank in Michigan. He has an MBA from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's in economics from the University of Michigan. Go blue. Woo, go blue. So let's all welcome Jerry uh, to the podium. Thank you very much, Brittany. Uh, it's just a joy to be here at my alma mater. Uh, the, you know, the sign says, you know, the secret. And the, the secret is that 30 years ago, I actually had Keith's job. I don't know where Keith, Keith's in the very back. Keith, give us a little wave. Yeah. Uh, I was a security guard right here at this museum. And, and uh, in addition to being a security guard, I was actually an art history major until I wasn't an art history major anymore. I, uh, uh, it's a, kind of fun. I, uh, between my sophomore and junior year, I applied for and received a job offer from Sotheby's, the art auction house in, in New York, and I remember it like it was last week. Uh, it was a Friday afternoon, the head of human resources called me up and said, congratulations, uh, we'd like to offer you a job. In fact, we liked you so much, two departments would like to have you, and you get to choose which department. I thought, wow, is that ever fantastic. Can I take the weekend to think about it and call you back on Monday? absolutely take the weekend. I said, you know, not that it matters all that much for a summer, but is there any difference in the pay between one department and the other that might lean me one way? No, no, they're both free. <laughs> free. <laughs> free was not what I was expecting. I said, free, do you, do you mean unpaid, gratis? I think you might be misusing the word. And, and, <laughs> and she said, uh, well, we're looking for people who love art for art's sake. And I said, well, I do love art for art's sake but I work for pay. And uh, needless to say, it went downhill from there. I changed my major from art history to economics, and uh, that turned out to be a pretty good career choice. Uh, and, and so anyway, it's, it's a, a great joy for me when Brittany and, and, and uh, Kimby and uh, uh, Jill from our office, when we were planning this thing, we said, let's have it at the museum. I was very excited to come here and to share a secret from my industry with Michigan women. And, and by the way, when I say Michigan women, I would like to highlight the fact uh, that of, of Michigan women includes my daughter, Grace. Give a little wave, Grace. My, my nieces, Amelia and Anna. Anna, Amelia, will you wave? Another Michigan woman is my sister, Julie. Uh, my wife, Lisa, is, is uh, a Michigan woman. And my dear late mother, Barbara Strong O'Brien, is a Michigan woman. So it is with great joy that I come here and share a secret from my industry with Michigan women, and, and uh, my industry being the alternative asset management business. And so, anybody recognize this, this sculpture? Let me, let me give you a hint. Right here. <laughs> so this is Nydia. And uh, Nydia is actually the very first work of art ever acquired by the University of Michigan Museum. It was acquired in 1862. That's 157 years ago, but to make it more contemporary, that's 17 years before we started playing football. So, it's, uh, so I guarded Nydia with my life for four years, uh, and it's a joy for her to share this secret. And, and you know, stated crisply, 
you know, I believe that regardless of what part of the business she leads, the role of a leader in alternative asset management, and whether she comes from the front office, like Adrian Thorson, who is our chairwoman and CEO of our subsidiary company, Marinette. Adrian, we give a little wave. Or, or Kari Johnson, who is the managing director and head of impact investing for O'Brien Staley Partners. Or from the middle office, like Jen Whitakey, who's our uh, head of risk management and a director in investor relations. Or from the back office, Jill Wilrabi, who, by the way, head of talent recruiting. If you're looking for a job, you should meet Jill. Uh, Jill, <laughs> give, give a quick right. So regardless of what part of the business she leads, the role of a leader in alternative asset management is just one thing and that is to convert a trading desk culture or mentality into a sustainable business. And you know, by that I mean you need to consider things from all angles. You need to see the hidden value in both complexity and in simplicity. You need to thrive in the chaos of change and never finished work. You need to be able to deal with incomplete information and see a masterpiece even when critical elements are missing. And you need to recognize that negative space is as important as positive. Deciding what not to do makes you more powerful. Let me give a couple examples from art. Yep, that's a urinal. <laughs> but, so uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, a famous artist, entered this into an art contest in New York in 1917. It's called Duchamp's Fountain. And, and uh, you know, obviously it's a urinal, but if you change the perspective and the context, you can see it as a work of art. It is, after all, a beautiful biomorphic, meaning lifelike shape. It's polished uh, uh, porcelain, it has nice undulations, and if you put it in the right context, you can, you can see it as a work of art. And, you know, it's, it's the same in alternative asset management. You need to be able to look at things from a different perspective. And, and you need to be able to see a trade develop that other people are saying, that's junk. And we have an expression in our business, if you think something is the worst idea you've ever heard of, you're just on the wrong side of the trade. Because from the other side of the trade, it's the greatest idea you ever heard of. Uh, so you need to keep an eye out for that. In a, a different example, this is to see hidden value in complexity. And this, of course, is uh, Michelangelo's masterpiece, the center panel of the Sistine Chapel, the creation scene. Uh, it was you know, created in 1508, 1512, and if anybody ever read uh, the book, Agony and the Ecstasy, or saw the movie, you know the four-year feud that Michelangelo had with the Pope. Michelangelo did not want to paint. He said, I'm a sculptor. Uh, I don't want to lay on my back and, and paint. And the Pope said, I'm the Pope. You're going to lay on your back and, and paint the center panel. And so you might actually think that the Pope won that battle. Uh, but not exactly, because embedded in the center panel of the Sistine Chapel was a hidden image. And what you need to understand, and it's obviously the hemisphere of the brain, you can see the brain stem, the frontal lobe, uh, the, the, the thalamus. Uh, you need to understand that at that time it was against canon law to do dissection of human cadavers. Yet in the center panel of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo pulled one over on the Pope and painted, you know, the hemisphere of the brain. This, by the way, was 350 years before Gray's Anatomy was created. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let me give you a more contemporary example. And this uh, iconic image, uh, this is, this is uh, Annie Leibovitz's uh, uh, The Legends of Hollywood from 2001, Vanity Fair. And, you know, you might kind of think that Annie Leibovitz famous photographer, she just shows up, snaps a picture, if it looks good, you know, they print it. Uh, but that actually belies incredible precision and complexity. You can probably see easily the triangular or pyramidal composition. And if you have an iPhone, you're probably familiar with, with the, uh, the rule of thirds. And, and, you know, but if you look a little bit deeper, you can see the dynamic symmetry of rebated squares. And if you look even a little bit deeper again, you can see the rule of thirds on the bias or on a diagonal. And it's actually repeated thrice in the comp composition. And, and there's also, you know, if you're a mathematics person, the golden ratio and fractals of the re rectangle repeating itself, repeating itself, repeating itself. And if you go even deeper still, 
you can see the elliptical groupings of all of the heads, all the images, all the subject matter. And my personal favorite is the arabesque, which despite all this mathematics brings again the biomorphic curves and brings it back to humanity and gives it motion. So this, this is incredibly complex and it's this precision and complexity that makes this an iconic work of art. And you need to be able to see, recognize, and appreciate that same complexity in alternative asset management if you want to be a leader in the business. On the other end of the spectrum, you need to be able to see the hidden value in simplicity. In 1942, so the story goes, Pablo Picasso was walking through a junkyard and he saw standing, sitting on the ground some handlebars and not too far away he saw a bicycle seat. And in a flash, his mind put the two together into what is a masterpiece called Bullhead. This hangs in the Picasso Museum in Paris now and it is unmistakably a bullhead. Well, sometimes in alternative asset management, trades are just that easy. They're sitting right there, and a leader has to have the courage to pick it up and say that is a great trade, even though everybody else has walked right by it and hasn't seen it. At the same time, a leader has to be able to deal with incomplete information and see a masterpiece when critical elements are missing. The two most famous works of art in the world, probably, right? The Wing Victory or the Nike of Samothrace and, and the uh, uh, Venus de Milo. Both of them are recognized as masterpieces by everybody in this room, despite the fact they're both missing their arms and one's missing her head. Okay? Well, it's the same in alternative asset management. A leader needs to be able to see and communicate a vision even when the, the data is missing and may be missing forever. You must recognize the negative space is as important as positive space. Let me, let me define negative space for you real quick. In, in art history terms or in art appreciation terms, imagine these sculptures, uh, you know, you have uh, the Kuros, which is the, the rather stationary, this is from the archaic period in Greece, uh, and then you have the Poseidon, uh, the Zeus Poseidon sculpture, which is from the Hellenistic. Uh, the, the, imagine the, the rock coming straight up from the plinth or the base, and you had to chisel away above the head and, and below the arms to create the Kuros. Well, you didn't chisel away as much rock as you did in the outstretched arm and outstretched legs of the Poseidon. So the more negative space, the more rock you threw away, the more powerful and dynamic the piece. It's the same in business. Good leaders decide in advance what not to work on. And not working on things make you stronger. In economics, we talk about the 80-20 rule, or Pareto efficiency. It's the same in art, it's the same in music. Matt back there playing the guitar would tell you that music is made up of notes and rests, not just notes. So it's the same thing, positive negative space. Okay. Uh, you must also thrive in the chaos of change and never finished work. So these uh, three sculptures are called The Unfinished Slaves by Michelangelo, or in Italian, Non Finito. Uh, and if you ever go to Florence to visit the David, it's in the academy and you'll be staring right at the, the David. If you turn 180 degrees behind, you'll find these three statues. There's actually a fourth one too. Uh, you'll find these statues. And I love them. You know, so they were done in 1530, so they're over 500 years old. They're called unfinished, but I think he was finished. Because you can actually feel the tension as the slaves are trying to escape the rock and even push the rock off of his head. And I don't think that any, any more work or any more polish would have made this any more finished. In, in alternative asset management, the leaders need to, to realize you have to do all the work until the work is done. And you know the markets close at 4.30 in the afternoon and the traders go home. But the leaders stay and they worry about information technology and human resources and taxation and compliance uh, and all the other non-P&L revenue generating items. That's the difference between being a leader and just a trader. And speaking of traders, uh, this, this work of art is, is uh, my, my, one of my favorites. This is Diego Rivera's Detroit Industry Murals. It's at the DIA. It's only about 45 minute drive you know, up, up Highway 94 if you ever want to go see it. Uh, and I've always been struck by this, this uh, mural and uh, by how much the trading desk looks like an assembly line. Row after row after row of people working on the same thing day after day. And you know you need to not fall into the trap uh, with traders of thinking that the traders are the leaders of the business. They're important, and the assembly line workers are important, but they're not the leaders of the business. 
and it's very important uh, to recognize the distinction. Uh, it kind of reminds me, uh, and, and thank you, Brittany, for the introduction. My very first job uh, out of Michigan uh, was a chemical bank, and I was, which is now J.P. Morgan Chase, and I was trained as a credit analyst, which meant I spread numbers and I did CAMEL, capital asset management earnings liquidity analysis of businesses and I was in short trained to be a banker and then one day I was put on a deal team where the client company was another bank and I realized I had no idea how a bank works I had no idea how banks raised deposits or originated loans or, or how they you know secured capital and dealt with analysts and regulators so I called myself a banker but I really wasn't and, and or I didn't know how it worked. And that's when I realized I should go get my MBA and round out all of my skills. And so I know that's perhaps why many of you are here too. So, um, you know, what's the secret to converting a trading desk culture into a sustainable business? You know, people often, uh, you know, prioritize correctly. And, and, you know, especially when you come to a great school like Michigan, you all have your top three priorities, right? You know, we might argue about what's number two and what's number three, but you got your top three priorities right. But people actually have to then go on and do everything on the list. And, and that is what makes the difference between being a trader and a leader. So, as you can tell, I still love art for art's sake. And, and uh, you know, even after changing my major, I think that uh, having the background in art history helped me get my first job. And I was, I was sharing uh, over lunch today that uh, uh, I actually, because I changed my major in the middle, I, it, I had 72 job interviews before getting my first job offer. And I have the thank you notes and the rejection letters to prove it. Uh, but on my 73rd, I met with Chemical Bank. And uh, I was kind of eager, and I bet you would be too after 72 interviews. Uh, so I showed up an hour early to, to, the, to the bank. Well, what do you do when you show up an hour early? I wandered around the lobby and I studied their art history, their, their uh, corporate art collection. And an hour later, a VP of credit came down and greeted me. And, and she, you know, the, she greeted me with the typical pleasantries. Nice to meet you. How was your trip? How was your hotel? Did you find us OK? And I said, yes. In fact, I was an hour early. And she said, well, what did you do for an hour? And I said, well, I, I enjoyed your, your corporate art collection. And she said, well, what did you notice? I said, you have a wonderful collection from the Hudson River Valley School. She said, really, anyone in particular? Yep, you, you have an absolutely wonderful uh, Cropsey. And, I, and uh, she said, really, what did you notice about the Cropsey? And I said, well, I really love the autumn palette he paints with. It feels just like the fall in America. And, and so she, you know, she kind of, we went on, we had the interview, it all went well. Well, I, I learned like a month later, not only was she the VP of credit, she was the curator of the art collection. And, and needless to say, she noted that, that I had something extra besides being good at economics and finance and capital asset pricing model and you know, all those things that they teach you that I had a little something else to share. And I bring this up and I share it with you so that if you're at all worried that your undergraduate degree in philosophy or history or French could put you at a disadvantage to someone who has a BBA before an MBA or something like that, don't worry about that. Rest assured that that point of differentiation is what will make you a leader when you find the right place to work. So I, 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 I hope that this inspires a little bit of conversation as we go on with our cocktail hour. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Adrian and Jill and Kari and Jen, and I apologize, Mark Moores is here too. Uh, uh, we, we will stay for the cocktail hour and meet with you. Brittany, thank you very, very much. You, you are, as our fight song says, you are truly a leader and best. Thank you very much, and go blue. Jerry, thank you so much for coming here and for helping us put on this wonderful event. We really appreciate it. It's a small kudos. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.